I'm going to go out there and talk to Mark. Yeah, you are. Is he out there? Uh, yeah, Mark's out there. Okay. You are live oh. on Phil. It's on you. On Facebooks and the YouTubes? On Facebooks and, and the YouTube. The Facebook, just one. Just one? All right. Welcome, everybody. It's another Friday here in the Woodsmith Shop, and probably in a lot of other places it's still Friday as well. So, greetings to everybody in Facebook land and on the YouTubes. Uh, we thought we'd go around and do our normal bit and see what's going on around the shop. We have a couple of pro we have one project that's all wrapped up that's kind of fun to be able to see the the cherry on the top, so to speak, of that. So I think what we might do is go on a little field trip. So I hope everybody's got their permission slip signed because we're going to head out into the photo studio and talk about the uh, the table that Mark's been working on. And if we're, we might be able to get the designer to talk about the project <laughs> a little bit too. Yes, that's awkward. Oh yeah. <laughs> Go out there? Yeah. So keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle. Narrow passage. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so this is the trestle dining table that uh, John designed behind the camera there and Mark's been working on. You've been seeing him work on that. And Mark, anything you want to add to this as you've wrapped it up? Hello everyone. Um, yeah, this week I've been working on the, getting the trestle table wrapped up, so pretty much all done. Just got to secure it to the, um, the legs and the base. Um, I'm going to build a bench that goes with this table. So currently I'm working on that. So that'll be done in the week. So, so yes, this, there it is. I, I feel like this has been two different projects. There's the it top has. and dealing with the, the patina and not right. trying to affect that. And then there's been the base, which has been kind of right. a little bit more regular woodworking. Yeah, as I previously mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to leave this surface as intact as I possibly can. So it's got the natural grain and the natural color to it. Um, with the base, once it was all milled, it was kind of a complete different colour, just natural um, fur. So what I did to that, I got the, the torch on it and went round and give it some burn and scorch marks on it. As you see, just give it that bit more of a barn wood look and to kind of match the top a little bit more. And then just spray it with a, with a lacquer finish. And then on the top, it's got several coats of lacquer just to seal it all, so that's pretty much it. Because that's really the deal with, you know, like the, the barn wood looks super cool, right. but for all of us with children, the yes. idea of cleaning up after somebody spills on a barn wood piece, yeah. you know, you needed some way to be able to wipe it, wipe yeah. it off. And this, this started off really, really rough, and the, the grain was really deep. So after numerous coats of finish, I think off, Kind of fill those crevices in a little bit, so sure. it's a little bit more flatter. So I think it turned out pretty nice. Yeah. So yeah. Um, on to the next project, <laughs> which is the um, the Dylan designed. What is it? Console cabinet. Yeah, um, LP. So I'll get started on that next week. Now, John, as the designer on this, what was uh, what were the things that you were most concerned about? Um, just Mark being mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest concern. What was that? Oh, just getting you all the drawings on time. Because I spent days chiseling yes. away at those yeah, three inch big deep mortises. mortises and yep. pinnings and figuring out the finish and what to do and picking out lumber. So no, it, was, it was a pretty cool project. But, I mean, yeah. it's, it's different from what we usually do, so it's and, kind of interesting. And doesn't weigh as much as we thought. No, it no. doesn't. No. I mean, it's heavy, right? But it's firm. Right. It's right. still yeah, it's fairly light. Nice. If that was oak, it'd be a different story. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, it's amazing whoever built that corn crib 200 years ago. If they ever would have thought a table would be constructed would, from that would one come day. From it. Yeah. So. Especially as they were just probably thinking, just grabbing the next board off the pile to yep. to use it in there. So what was the company that we got those from? 
Uh, I have the card in my pocket. It's, <laughs> I'm gonna reach it? it in there. Yeah. <laughs> so let me reach into my pocket. Is it Iowa backyard. Barnwood? Yeah, yeah, Iowa yeah. Barnwood or uh, Reclaimed Harvest. Yeah. Dot com is yeah. their Reclaimed Harvest dot com. I'm gonna double check. Is their yeah. website. All right, we'll put a Google link it. to them on the notes yeah. that go along yeah. with this because they were really fun to work with and yeah. they provided the backstory on well, where the material yeah. came yeah. from. Yeah. So interesting history on the where the wood came from. So. Which is funny because, did they say when it was built? I think in the 1930s, I think the barn was constructed. Okay. And then it was dismantled of some of this year. So, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty old barn. Right. And there's the end result. Yeah. But for the 30s, for Douglas fir, I mean, that would have had to come from the Pacific Northwest. Old growth. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Tight grain. Tight, even grain. Nice to work with. And no Douglas fir in Iowa. And no Douglas fir in Iowa. It's not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not after the they buffalo, got taken down. The buffalo ate it all. Yeah. yeah. Reclaimed har uh, harvest reclaimed, I believe. Yep. Does that yep. sound right? Yep, that's right. So down by Winterset, Iowa. Yep. yep. Winterset, Iowa. So while you're there, you can pick up some uh, old Iowa barn boards and see all the bridges, covered yep. bridges. Stop by Chris Fish's house for a uh, glass of lemonade. Right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> see the cats. He's not here today, so he can't. Yeah, yeah we can. Yes, we'll just stop in. <laughs> Tell him John sent you. Yeah. All, All right. right. Back in the shop, you got Back some in the shop. I got some stuff. Yeah, some stuff. And just another pit stop on the travels. If anyone was interested how the Empire chest oh, yeah. turned out, yeah. well, there it is, because I don't think I ever got to show the finished product. So. Yep. In its natural habitat here, yep. and it's set. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, that turned out pretty nice as well. So, there it is. So that'll be coming up in issue 247. Seven. That one we're just finishing up, so. As a sneak peek. And the stool, mm -hmm. Dylan's stool. Any last words on the uh, Empire chest? No, I think that's it. Turn to look great. Let everyone see yeah. it. If anyone was interested what the finished product I like the color like. difference between the, mm -hmm. between the top, the turnings, and the feet, and the rest of the case. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's a good contrast without it being to start. Right, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Scott, yes, the table will be in a future issue. I believe that will be in issue 248, which will be the spring. Spring? Yep. So, like March, March April. April? Yeah, yep, I think so. Uh, so, I have, uh, in the last couple weeks, gotten back into the shop, and uh, obviously my apron's on, it's covered in glue. I'm covered in glue, and there is a pile of cutting boards on the bench back here. Uh, tis the season, so uh, we are in uh, Christmas present mode. Um, at least Phil and I are. Phil is, has wrapped up most of his. I think he might be working on some more, maybe. Uh, but uh, I have been in uh, cutting board heaven over here. Um, clearing out some scraps that I've had floating around for a while. I did order some hard maple and cherry to make some cutting boards, but we are doing a large batch of cutting boards for Christmas presents. Um, so it's been a, a fun little break from furniture uh, stuff. So got some walnut, have some random pattern ones here uh, that have some you know, cherry maple, uh, there's some mahogany in here, there's some walnut, there's some beech somewhere in this as well. Um, just kind of a fun way to, to use up little scraps that uh, we as woodworkers always tend to, to hoard. And I think my wife has always secretly judged me for holding on to like these little scraps. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like why would I hold on to a piece of walnut that big? Well, it's because you can cut it. It has the potential. It has the potential. And you know, you never want to discount something's potential or someone's potential. Right. So uh, having a bunch of scraps in my storage garage uh, has allowed me to make a bunch of cutting boards. So, so are they all end grain? They are all end grain. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're all end grain. I've made face grain cutting boards before. I have one actually that I use uh, every day. Um, I have an elm one that I made. Yeah. That is, it's edge grain actually. Um, and it works okay. It just, it gets beat up fairly quickly. Yeah, you know, I would you know say I mean. that because I have a cherry one and a maple one. Yeah, that we use and it, they do get beat up. They get beat. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we if we they're definitely it, a lot easier. They, oh, they're way easier. You know, you just have to glue it up and then sand it down. Um, the grain 
of course you you basically you glue up a bunch of strips side by side like that uh, you plane it down and then you cut it apart into sections like this and then you stand them on edge and then glue them back together uh, so that's where a pattern like that comes in or comes from um, but of course being end grain we have fibers of the wood that are sticking up uh, basically like straws so as you cut you're cutting in between the straws and it's almost self-healing right so so the end grain cutting boards while they do take uh, they take a little more effort to make and more glue and more a lot more <laughs> glue I think shout out to Titebond uh, we have right. some Titebond jugs here from some videos we shot for them yep right there uh, we shot some uh, videos for Titebond oh man it was middle of summer wasn't it yep uh, and they left us a couple jugs of glue I went through a full gallon I believe of Titebond 3 in these cutting boards so lots of glue lots of work but I think it gives you a better end result and or something that's gonna be a Christmas present for people I know. You know, it's right. it's fun to uh, not so much fun to work in, but it's fun to create something that they're like, how? Um, they're just like those are all little squares. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's unbelievable. It's not that much work, but it's it's fun. No, and it's fun to see the payoff when people are opening up gifts. And it is, yeah. So, and it's funny because I was telling my wife as I was gluing up these cutting boards, I was very much you know, the first ones I glued up were these. Uh, were these solid grain maple and cherry ones. And I told her that I really liked the look of these, you know, just being solid cherry or solid maple. Um, but then I glued up these patchwork ones. And I, re I mean, obviously I have some cleanup to do on these still, but I kind of like the patchwork. It's, it's fun to get a little bit of a random pattern. You know, you have, I think I have three different patterns in here that are kind of mix and match to be random. So it's fun, it's, uh, it's cool, it's a fun way to use a lot of scraps and it's affirmation that I held onto those for a reason. So you won. So there's I won. won. Never throw anything yeah. away. Yeah. So yep. So what the question's gonna come up, yes. what's your favorite finish then for a cutting board? Mineral oil. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I will uh, we were talking about that before we started doing the live. Uh, not only did I go through a gallon of type on glue for these I will also probably go through a couple gallons of mineral oil as a finish. I will probably end up soaking these in a bath. Um, so throwing a shallow uh, container full of mineral oil and dunking them in there for a couple hours a piece. Let it soak in as much as I can. And then I will finish them with a uh, beeswax mineral oil mixture. Sure. And I will buff those out. Yeah. So, yeah. So mineral oil, uh, but because it's like no matter what finish you put on it, you're going to have to renew it. You have to renew it at some point. And mineral so, oil is easy. Right. And it's food safe. And it's inexpensive. You it, can find it anywhere. Yeah. I think you can buy um, gallon jugs you can buy for like 12 bucks. Um, you can yeah. buy the little pharmacy size ones for that are probably what, a pint maybe? Maybe a yeah. quart? Um, yeah, just for, at the drugstore. Yeah, for four or five bucks. And yeah. that's plenty to, to keep all your cutting boards in your house refreshed. Right. So, yeah. you know, as long as people don't throw them in the dishwasher, they should last for quite a while. And that's really the thing. I mean, you don't even need a finish on the cutting board. It's just more to make it look nice. It's, it's yeah, not it's, helping it necessarily. No, no. And the question always comes up about food safety and wood cutting boards. And that's a completely different debate because I've seen, I've seen studies where people say that you know, the, the wood draws moisture away from bacteria and kills the bacteria and they're actually safer than plastic cutting boards and that's just a complete, right. I mean, it's, it's a complete debate you can have. I don't use my cutting boards for meat, right, personally, um, but vegetables and anything else I cut, absolutely use them, yeah. uh, everything right on there. And then I just soapy water with a sponge and then dry them off immediately. Yeah. And every well, that's the nice thing, thing about the end grain cutting yeah. boards is they dry almost instantly. They do. Yeah. So that's kind of fun. Yep. So that's what I have. We'll see what they uh, look like next week when I'm hopefully done with them. Okay. Well, okay. The clock's ticking. Clock's ticking. So, all right, if we go over to my bench, you're going to start, well, not my bench. It's actually Chris's bench, but since he's not here today and Logan's got the one that we usually share all full up of cutting boards, I was working over here and I don't know if anybody remembers uh, one of the last times we were talking about uh, a little block plane that I have and I've been trying to come up with a new wedge for the back of the plane because while I like it and it's the one that we did originally for the magazine I sometimes feel like when I'm using it that my the heel of my hand is hitting the adjustment knob on the back 
which throws off the blade setting and the angle of the blade. So I wanted something that still allowed me to be able to use the plane in a one-handed grip, but then also offered a little better control for a two-handed grip for when I'm using it for uh, smoothing, because this, this plane has actually turned out to be really nice for a smoothing plane. So I've been working on a couple of prototypes, and the first one that I had is this guy. And honestly, I feel like this one worked pretty well. Logan tried it out mm -hmm. just to get an outsider's opinion on it. Uh, what I liked about this one is that it almost had that, what would we call it, like the old British chariot plane yeah. kind of look yeah, to like it. Yeah, plane or... Yeah, yeah. so yeah. when you held on to it, there was definitely a separation between your two hands for uh, two-handed work. You can kind of tuck your fingers underneath it, or you could still hold it pretty well one-handed mm -hmm. and be able to, to use it. I just felt like it was a little bit too much. It's a little large. Yeah. yeah, it would have worked okay, yep. but it, it does kind of didn't really fit too well with it. So the one that I have now that I'm, I think I'm pretty settled on, is this guy. And you can see it still wraps behind, so that it, my hand, when I have it on there, isn't going to be interfering with the adjustment knob in the back. Uh, it's got a nice look to it. I feel like the curve of this, which was kind of accidental as I was cutting it out really matches the profile of the front infill. Not that looks are all about the thing, but if it looks like it's one unit, I feel like it's a much better plane. Yeah. And more importantly, it's really comfortable to hold uh, both still one-handed and in the, the two-handed position. So I feel like this one's gonna be my winner and um, I'm insetting a little, to hold on to the, the knob from the lever cap um, I'm insetting a little piece of brass dowel. I'm going to trim that flush and then uh, put a little dimple on it, just like the original one. And that just forms a seat for that dowel, or for the, the adjustment knob. So anyway, it'll be fun to see that one put back together and then to put it into use and um, continue to work on it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think you said how looks aren't everything, but... I feel like personally, and I don't know if you feel the same way. I work better if my if I if, if I like the way my tools look. I mean, it sounds yeah. it sounds kind of shallow. I mean, a little bit and a little weird, yeah, and a little weird. But like looking at so one of my favorite planes I have is Bill Carter plane. Right, right. it's a beautiful little boxwood smoother, and looking at that, knowing craftsmanship that went into it, makes me feel like I can be better in my work. Right, you know, and this is a little deeper than I was expecting this to come out, but it's I mean, something confession. that it's yeah, got real confessions. Uh, but no, I, I I agree with you that if you have to be happy with how your tools look, right? So something like that where it looks like it matches, it just makes it feel better to use, and you know, inherently, it's like you do better work with it. Right. So right. Yeah. Well, in case in point, for another yes. example, is. Uh, you picked up a set of these. No, I didn't. If my wife's listening, I did not. I did not pick up a set. A of mystery those. set of <laughs> these uh, gouges. Gouges from Dr. Barton. Dr. Barton. I don't know who told me that, but yeah. Well, it yeah. says on there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it was a set that was stamped with a Board of Education on a bunch of them, and they look really nice. I've been. I'm in the process of sharpening this one. I got one of them. Uh, but they have a really cool, we think it's an apple handle. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're like, apple, right? Yeah, yeah. so I mean, yeah, all joking aside, yeah, I, I, I got a set of five of them. And they looked like they were never used. They were a board of education, so I'm assuming they were in school, right? Right. Um, but the grinding on the bevel I thought was almost, Yeah. like it was pretty, it, not yeah. original necessarily. It, was, but, it wasn't freshly ground by any means. Right. Um, but they were beautiful. I mean, just set of five of them was sitting in a flea market, and I grabbed them. Um, and I know there's a couple of people watching in the Des Moines area, so I'm not telling you where I got them because I have picked up some Dr. Barton stuff from this flea market before. Uh, but it's yeah, case in point, it's a beautiful set of vintage tools as the 1882 stamp on there, I believe. Um, so they were made somewhere in the 1840s, the 1880s range. Um, so for a tool, it's 150 plus years old, um, 
or 180 years old yeah. now. Uh, they're beautiful and they're, they're fun to use. And I think they're Apple, and you were talking about maybe rehandling some of your other Right, because, you know, this one, it just is, I just want to use it. And then I found that, that this handle shape, I really like the yeah. feel of it for, you know, how it's got the this little neck area kind of forms a stop for your thumb. So when you're pushing on the tool, you you know, it's not likely for you to slip off. And it's got a, it's a nice size to, to hold on to. It would fit in the back of your hand for pairing work, that kind yeah. of thing. So I have this set of, uh, of regular bench chisels, Craftsman bench chisels. Um, my wife got them for me as a wedding gift. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I know that these have kind of taken some abuse in the press about their cheapness or whatever. But I found that the steel is actually pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, I use them all the time. I love them. The only thing that I'm not a huge fan of is the shiny black handle. You know, overall the shape isn't too bad and I've just had them for so long yeah. I just kind of get used to them. But I've long thought about replacing the handle and I've toyed with a variety of different ideas and designs and I feel like I might want to try turning a couple of, mm -hmm. turning a set of this because I think it would look, work really well with this, yeah. with this style. Even though the blades are much shorter, but I still... I, I think, think it would be really cool. Yeah. So, would you would you put a, a hoop on the backside for See, metal work or not? I don't know because this one almost looks like it was designed for a hoop, and maybe it would have been yeah. if, it, if it was a different type of tool. It, it could have been. It could have been a Barton mass-produced handle. Yeah. And then it went on different, different tools, tools. And if it was some a, got a hoop. Yeah. yeah. Some got a hoop. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure if I would or not, because I have some other carving gouges that I don't have hoops yeah. on, and I pound on those and they're infrequently, and they're fine. I mean, that's yeah. even a walnut handle, so. It's yeah, not. well, and one thing that you said with these, um, I don't know if this is when you pulled the handle off, there's actually a shoulder here. Yeah. So it's not like you're driving a tang into it. It's going to cause yeah, everything to split. split. Yeah. yeah, there is a shoulder on yeah. there, so. Anyway, it's just kind of one of those things. Usually about this time of year, after I wrap up my Christmas gift making, I start uh, working on some stuff. You know, as I've been building, I've been thinking about upgrades for my shop or new tools or tools that I really don't need anymore. So I've kind of started looking at some of my tools, like my chisels, about rehandling those and some other things that I can do in my workshop. So uh, I think Logan's making one more last check on questions. Otherwise, we might just wrap things up today. Yeah, I got a lot of, a lot of comments, a lot of hello from Korea, Saskatchewan, yeah, a lot of hellos from everywhere, which is uh, fun to see. We're hello right we say, back at you. Yeah, we are international. <laughs> yeah. But no, uh, somebody mentioned that our maple cutting boards um, or butcher's blocks were used, you know, for hundreds of years in right. in butcheries, which is true. So. Right. So if my dad's watching here at some point, if you want to chime in on the comments, because he grew up, my grandpa was a butcher, yeah. so and he remembers yeah. having to to scrape the chopping block every night yeah, which we is, got down to bare wood. And, yeah, yeah, which is interesting because I, I feel like people always, you know, those of us that frequent flea markets or antique stores see butcher's blocks all the time. Yeah. And they're always ditched. All they're ditched. And everyone's like, oh, they must have been chopping a lot. No, nope. it's, it's not scraping. chopping. Chopping does not hurt end grain. Yeah. It's from scraping, scraping it down to bare wood. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was an easier way to sterilize and that's why they were made so thick. So, yeah, because you could just kind of go at it. Yeah, yeah. which... By now, the way, periodically, I know that they would flatten yeah, flat, yeah. because otherwise they just weren't easy to use. Exactly. You get a hollow and you can't chop down and yeah. you cut fully. Which, by the way, I feel like we have a maple cutting... Or do we sell our butcher's block? We, we maybe sold that. Oh, crap. Say, I was going to have another Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> but so, that's all we have. A uh, seminar coming up. Yeah, two weeks yep. from yesterday is the last seminar for 2019. We're going to talk about dust control solutions. Uh, we've already gotten a couple of questions in on yes. it about what we're going to be yep. able to cover on there. Uh, some of the things that we want to talk about are the ducting, mm -hmm. the safety, static concerns, yep. uh, airflow clearly. I mean, it's a big safety. Yeah. I mean, it's shop cleanliness on one hand, but it's, it's really a safety tool yeah. uh, on managing dust control. But we're going to look at it from small shop infrequent DIYer kind of people all the way up to somebody who has a has a dedicated space. Yep. So uh, go to woodsmithshop.com slash seminars and register for those and then there you'll also be able to see next year's seminars. We've got a whole full slate that I think is going to be pretty cool. Yeah, so it will be. Otherwise 
Everybody have a great weekend. John, you got any last words? No. Nope. No. Nope. All right. That's the way to go out on. Thanks, everybody. Stay dusty. Bye.